Okay, we're gonna answer the question. How do you make shrimp bisque? And not just shrimp bisque, but all shrimp bisque, or all bisques, uh, shellfish soups is really what bisque soup means. And as, we, as I'm making the soup, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about bisque soup, but we're gonna get it started so uh, I have something to do with you during the downtime on making the soup. First thing we're gonna do is we're gonna cook the mirepoix, the celery, carrots, and onions, and get that started. Take a little bit of butter. And we'll dump the mirepoix in there. Mirepoix again means celery, carrots, and onions. And we're gonna put a little bit of the dried leaf thyme. And a pinch more butter. I want to make sure that I have enough oil to actually cook the veg. Remember, the butter, the oil, the duck fat, whatever it happens to be that you're using in a pan, it is the thing that transfers the heat from the metal to the food. The oil does. You can have enough oil in there, you can, heat doesn't get transferred, it builds up in the pan, and, and that's how sometimes things get burnt. So, what I did was I got some 45, 50 size shrimp here, frozen, which are perfect. I bought these raw, peeled and deveined with the tail removed. You remember when you make bisque soup, your shrimp needs to be peeled and deveined. I'm gonna chop it up just a little bit. Now, I had a whole pound, but I saved about six or seven shrimp because I'm gonna show you how to use them for garnish in the bowl when we're ready to serve the soup later, okay? Just gonna chop it up a little bit because keep in mind everything that goes inside this pot is gonna get, end up getting pureed anyway. Now, there are plenty of recipes for different kinds of bisque soups. What I will tell you right now is the common denominator among bisque soups. And now there are people that will disagree with this, but it's only because they haven't studied the history of this soup very well. Um, technically, there's really no such thing as a mushroom bisque or a tomato bisque because bisque soups are made with shellfish and white wine and mirepoix and garlic and sometimes tomato. And we might throw a little a tomato or two in here just for fun too. Um, but uh, I see in the public domain of cooking and retail purchasing, um, bisque soups are always made with shellfish and white wine and garlic and mirepoix and cream and white stock, you know? So the mirepoix, which is cooked enough for me, and I'm gonna show you what that looks like right now. Okay, I'm gonna add the shrimp to this now. And we're gonna cook this just long enough for the shrimp to get cooked. Meanwhile, I'm gonna show you quickly how I would normally puree my garlic and that would be in the food processor. We don't need all that garlic, but over the course of uh, cooking today, I might, you know? There you have it. Now, every time I add garlic to the soup, <clears throat> people who are watching always say, that's way too much garlic. 
bisque soups get a little bit more garlic than you might think, and it doesn't come out in the soup as having too much garlic in it, ever. So keep that in mind when you see how much garlic goes in the soup. Um, okay, the shrimp is about half cooked, and I'm gonna get ready to pour some white wine in there. And I'm gonna show you a little bit about and talk to you about what burnt brandy is. And burnt brandy is when you take regular brandy and put it in a pan. This is something that's gonna go into the soup later when it's finished. I believe this recipe calls for about four ounces and I just put about four or five ounces in there. So burnt brandy, which is, remember now, brandy is simply concentrated white wine. And um, burnt brandy means that you light it, burn off all the alcohol, and all you have left is this concentrated aged, usually uh, oak barrel aged brandy. <clears throat> now, whenever you put your brandy on and you want to burn it, be careful of one thing, and that is that it may just combust when it gets really hot. So you kind of want to control when it combusts and you do so. By getting it hot, just tip it. There it goes, okay? It did just combust. Now we're going to add the garlic to the mirepoix and the shrimp. That looked like enough, but I'll just put a pinch more. Now you can take this here and just set it down on your table anywhere you want and let it burn off all by itself. Now now that you've brought the brandy to a boil, you can just let it sit off and burn off on the side. Okay, now we're going to add the white wine to the shrimp. And I believe my recipe calls for two cups. And that was about two cups, give or take. I could throw in a little pinch more in there. And we're going to reduce that down by 75%. Now, previously, I made some white chicken stock, and I boiled some converted rice, plain. And what we're going to do is we're going to use the rice to thicken the soup. We're going to puree all of these ingredients with the stock and the soup together. Now, this soup looks incredibly simple in some ways, and it is. But the most important thing to understand about the particular formula and methods that I'm employing in making the shrimp bisque soup is can be completely duplicated for lobster, oyster, crayfish. Those would be the four primary bisque soups on the planet, shrimp, lobster, oyster, and crayfish. Oyster is remarkably good if you like oyster also. Now, the question is how much rice do you put in there? Uh, every pot of soup that you make is just a little bit different. And um, the thing to remember is that you know, add a little bit of rice and you puree it. And what we're going to do is we're going to batch puree the bisque soups in these little cylinders with a pureeing stick um, so that we can get it really nice and smooth. Because I don't intend on straining this soup when I'm done with it. I'm going to puree it as really as smooth as I can and then finish it like that. Believe it or not, the soup, this white wine, is almost reduced because of the uh, uh, size and the, uh, the width and the mouth of this particular pot. Now, if you have a taller pot that's got not as wide of a mouth or a, a pot that just doesn't have as wide a mouth as this, period, whether it's taller or not, it takes longer to reduce. Now, the other thing we're going to do now is we're going to reduce the cream that is going to end up going into the recipe and we're going to reduce that to the same consistency that we want the soup to be. That way we won't be changing the texture of the soup when we add the cream. Because we're going to create a soup texture and adjust it, and then we're going to add the butter and cream to it at the end, okay? I think this recipe calls for two to three cups of cream. So it depends how creamy you want it. I'll put two to three cups in there and then we'll reduce it and find out how much we want to use. If we don't want to use it all, we won't use it. Okay, this wine has reduced about 75% right now. Okay, and I'm going to add the stock to it 
and some of the rice, okay? Being careful not to put too much rice in, because remember, I can always add more rice to the soup. Uh, after I puree it with the rice in, if it's not thick enough, I could also put a pinch of cornstarch in it, or throw a pinch of roux in it, or whatever I needed to do to adjust the texture, okay? So we're gonna put the white stock in here. And I'm gonna throw a tomato, which is optional in this recipe. Just give it a little tint of pink color. It'll make it appear a little bit more shrimp-like, okay? In terms of the visuals, this soup is gonna taste like shrimp. You'll notice that throughout this course, you will never see me pre-purchase, if you will, any, uh, I don't know, I guess you could call them phony food flavoring additives like chicken base and beef base and things like that. There's shrimp base, clam base, ham base, you, you name it, there's a base for it out there. But uh, this course is about you learning how to make the flavor yourself. Not to say that one wouldn't add some of these bases from time to time if you felt the need to or you wanted to enhance it or for whatever reason you didn't have enough shrimp but you had a little shrimp base you want to throw. I don't recommend it, but I know people will do it and I certainly wouldn't handcuff you from doing it, you know? So, we'll throw a little bit of tomato in here and we'll put like I said, some of the rice. Now, how much is some of the rice? Obviously, this is way more rice than I need. I just boiled a bunch of rice because I need some rice for something else later. But I'm going to throw a little bit in there like that. That's plenty for now. I probably put about a cup, cup and a half in there, something like that. Now we're going to let this simmer for about... 15 minutes to half an hour until all of the ingredients in the pot are what I consider to be easily pureable. And then we're gonna, oh, the cream is reducing here, hold on. And the cream just boiled over. You'll notice that I, I blew on it and it slowed it down also. I recommend that you pay more attention on your stove than I do because I'm paying attention to you instead of the cream. So. Anyway, we have it adjusted now, and it'll be reduced completely when I come back. Uh, in about 15 minutes, I'm going to give you a time-elapsed break right now, and I'll be back right now to finish it off. Okay, we're back right now, like I said. And the soup has been simmering, low-boiling for 15 minutes. And it looks tender enough to eat. And that's how you know when it's ready to puree. There's all your ingredients. Now we're going to batch puree this in a small cylinder like this. Now you can put this in a blender if you want also. But we're batch pureeing it in these cylinders because I want to make sure that it gets really smooth, okay? a little monster this thing which is great but it, by, by pureeing it in this type of cylinder makes it more powerful because the turbulence inside the pot is so much higher and stronger you know? Beautiful, beautiful. Let me show you how that's coming out. See, it's coming out good. I have a little. I had a little too much in that container. I couldn't really zap it the way I wanted to because it was going to overflow on me if I did. So I'm going to take a little bit of it out and re-zap that just a touch more. Staying with me during this entire pureeing process shows you how long it takes to make this, which isn't that long, but.
looks much better. See here? After we get it all pureed, then we'll uh, put it back in the pot and put it back on the stove. Okay. want to make sure I don't have any pieces of rice left inside this pot because I'm going to use this pot to return the soup to it. As in, starting with this one, we got pureed right here. See that nice pink color? A part of that's from the tomato, that's, which is what I suggested to you. The recipe doesn't have tomato in it, but you can add a little tomato to it. It certainly is not required. Excuse me, you're still going to have a slight tint, pink tint to the soup anyway from the carrots, okay? Um, you'll notice I keep referring to the recipe a little bit. Part of the reason why is I think you might, and I kind of wanted to make sure that my proportions were correct. I would normally just walk up to this pot and make this soup and never look at a recipe at all because I understand what the primary results and what results this formula will produce given whatever measurements I happen to be thrown in there. So, and if you're in this course very long, you're going to be cooking the same way, by the way. Good. Do the last one here. this to the pot, Let's add this to the pot, add that to the pot washer, okay, okay, now let's take a peek at it, this soup looks okay. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add, this soup doesn't, is not throwing off very much turbulence here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a pinch more stock to it. Which will thin it out slightly. But you'll notice that we have somewhat of a soup consistency right now, see? a little bit chunky, but by the time we get through pureeing in this pot, which we're also going to do when we add the butter and the cream, I'm going to use the pureeing stick to, to incorporate the butter into it, okay? Now, the cream, by the way, has been fairly reduced and looks good, and I'm probably going to use all of it because I would have a tendency to do that. Anyway, I like this soup to be a little bit creamy. It makes it a little bit more rich. And, um, of course, you don't want this soup to be too rich. This is not a sauce. Uh, sometimes people get mixed up when they're making soup and sauce. They make the soup so intense, you eat a bowl of soup and you're done having dinner. Um, let's do it like this now. Let's, uh, let's move the soup pot right here. And let's take some of the butter, which we're going to add to the soup and incorporate it in there right now. Now the proportions for buttering this soup or any soup are traditionally two ounces of whole soft unsalted butter per quart of soup, okay? Now obviously you wouldn't put butter like this into a chowder because it would just end up melting and then all the butter fat would come to the top. It would never become part of the soup. 
they would separate. Now, when I said I was going to puree the butter into it, and I pureed the soup a little more at the same time. I just want to give this a quick taste. I always like to keep in touch with where I am at the different stages of the flavoring of the soup. Now we're going to add the cream to the soup. Shut those burners off so I don't sweat to death back here. And Richard, I need a whisk. Uh, if you could grab one over, there's a bunch of them over there. And now the soup, bisque soups are traditionally seasoned with cayenne pepper. Uh, don't ask me why, but we're going to season it with a little bit of cayenne pepper. It has that little extra bite. Thank you, sir. Let's see what it tastes like now. Tastes good. Now we're going to add the burnt brandy, which I have right here. It's another flavoring agent for finishing the four primary bisque soups that there are. Again, oyster, crayfish, shrimp, and lobster. The soup is going to need some salt. And it's going to need a little bit of cayenne pepper. Or as they say on TV, some cayenne pepper. I caught that once for about five minutes. Um, all right, let's give it a taste now. The soup is good. What would I do to this soup now? Let me see here. I'm going to taste it again to make sure I'm satisfied with it. The soup doesn't need much done to it. I'm going to put a pinch more salt in there. And Richard, you got some sugar over there? Can you bring us some sugar over? Richard, who's our illustrious producer of these DVDs, is a jack of all trades. Now, thank you, sir. One of the things, I don't know if it says in this recipe or not, just a, a, a kosher salt and cayenne pepper to taste. If you think, you don't want to make your soup sweet, but there's such a thing as adding enough sugar to it, it just kind of softens it up a little bit. It's a little bit like when you add the two ounces of whole butter per quart. It mellows it and gives it that extra little flavor that you're looking for. So I put a teaspoon of sugar in there, give or take. So if there's any little teeny weeny little bittering edge to any of the pureed foods that are in it, that little piece of sugar in there that just softens it up for you, see? I'm gonna go just a little pinch more sugar, just a little bit pinch more salt. Now you'll notice the way this is being tasted and I'm bringing it to the plateau or the proper elevation of uh, both seasoning and flavoring earlier. And that's how you do it. There is no other way to do it, except gradually until you reach right where you want to be. Then you stop. Which I'm going to put just a pinch more salt in here still. The soup is good right now, but I'm going to put a pinch more sugar and a pinch more salt in it again. I go through so many spoons in this place, you wouldn't believe it. Now let's say your soup you thought was too thick. This would be a moment where you could add some cream unreduced right to it, which I don't think it's too thick, but it might be just a pinch. Let's we'll add a little bit more cream to it. One final taste. The soup still needs a pinch more salt, believe it or not. Let's have a taste of that. 
I'm going to put a pinch of sugar in there. This should be it. It's good. It's where I want it. Now, I didn't drag that off you on purpose. That was the process by which one would taste and season, taste and season, taste and seasoning. In that process, you learn how to taste it because you see the flavors coming out more and more as you add the seasoning to it. Okay, we have the soup done. Now, getting it into a bowl and get putting a little garnish in it, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you real quick how to make a couple of uh, soup croutons out of some French baguette bread here, okay? You can use whatever bread you want, but this makes specially nice round croutons. And what I have here is some clarified butter. I'm going to put a little bit of clarified butter in this pan. And we're going to make ourselves a couple of croutons. Now, normally, this is something that you would make earlier on, not when you're ready to serve the soup. But I'm not serving the soup to anyone except you. It's more important that you see how the process takes place. So normally, you would make your croutons and just leave them on a napkin sitting in the kitchen on a plate somewhere near where you're going to serve the soup into the bowls. And I have a little bit of chopped parsley here. And I'm going to put the, the, the butter's getting a little hot here, so I'm going to throw the bread in. This is very easy to burn the bread there, by the way. So what we're going to do is, um, if I can get past my mess here a little bit, which I usually can, um, we're going to, I have some of the shrimp that I saved that I didn't puree into the soup for garnish. So what I'm going to do is I cook them slightly in a little bit of butter. Now I just cut them in half like this here. So now remember, this is just a garnish. You don't need a whole bunch of shrimp in the soup. On the other hand, if you want, you can get yourself a bunch of those little small salad shrimp, for example, and maybe use more of those. But I wouldn't use more than three halves of this little soup here, because what you really want is you want people concentrating on the flavor of the soup itself, not getting carried away with the garnish. But I'm going to put a couple of other, oops, a couple of other garnishes in there um, to show you a couple of options. Okay, that bread's toasted. Don't let me burn that bread. As if you can remind me. Richard, you don't let me have to burn the bread. Um, and I'll just take, let's take a little, little teeny bit of tomato in here. Make some, let me call some cold tomato conchas in here. And I'm turning over the bread. You can see how that bread is coming along here. Okay. I have to stay with it though because it's gonna it'll it'll go away on me if I don't if I don't. That's cooked enough right now on both sides. Let's see. Oh yeah, see that? There we go. Now, let's do this here. Let's ladle some of the soup into the bowl. Now, normally, to serve your soup, you want a nice hot bowl. Don't serve, fill it up too high. Drop a crouton in. Let's go with one crouton on this soup. And let's go with little pieces of shrimp. You can float them right on top. And just for a little teeny, weeny, weeny, weeny pinch of added color, and take a little bit of chopped tomato and a little pinch of chopped parsley. And you're in business right there. Don't overkill the soup on the garnish. Um, if you want to put a second crouton in, you certainly can do that too. There you go. There's some shrimp bisque. And remember one thing about this recipe. The garnishes also. You can make all four of the primary bisque soups that there are, which are lobster, uh, shrimp, uh, oyster and crayfish using this exact same process. You just change the primary ingredient and maybe change the garnish a little bit. So there you have it, shrimp bisque. That answers that question, I hope. Bye-bye.